Since the day the budget was presented by Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman, we have heard much conflicting commentary on the budget. While many political commentators have sought to bestow on it a 1991 type halo, more seasoned economic analysts have cautioned against the increased tendency for hyperbole. The 1991 budget was very different. Even before it was presented, Dr. Manmohan Singh had started implementing its key proposals. He could do so because India was on the brink of default and that had opened up the political space for an economist to roll out corrective steps. This year's budget was also presented against the backdrop of extraordinary challenges. While a GDP contraction and a pandemic can be far more debilitating than a macroeconomic crisis, the image of situation for India is still not as desperate as the prospect of a default. If corrective steps are not taken in time, the economy can get into a downward spiral still. This can happen despite the projection of double digit growth next year and a faster than expected recovery. To avoid precisely that downward spiral was in fact the main task before the makers of the budget this year. Did they succeed in this task? Normally a budget can only lay out a blueprint and design a strategy. Implementation is rarely in the hands of finance ministry, but this time it's different. Turns out that this year the key to implementation success is also very much in the finance ministry's control. To talk about all that is riding on this year's budget and all that the budget is riding on, JP Morgan's chief India economist Dr. Sajid Chinoy joins me in today's episode. I asked Sajid if it is realistic to expect the budget to deliver sustainable recovery and growth. Sajid is very nuanced and articulate and he analyzes with clarity and consistency that's very rare. I'm thrilled he agreed to be the first guest of 2021 on the podcast. Hi Sajid, welcome to the Everyday Economics podcast. Thank you so much for taking out the time. Great to be here, Pooja. Um today I'd like to get your views on the budget uh in what is an extraordinary year and also uh, you know the coordination between the government's policies and the policies of the reserve bank of india since we are now recording this episode uh, nearly 9 days after the budget was first presented so uh, you've had a lot of time to uh, think about various aspects as well as listeners would have read a whole lot of uh, analysis and uh, so this is uh, i think going to be more like a, uh, looking at who has said what and what do we finally make out Uh, of what was presented on 1st of february great and um so we've heard many narratives about the budget many commentators and analysts including you have said that this budget marks a big shift and change in economic policy making and although its success in laying the ground for a sustainable economic recovery depends on implementation it is a good start Uh, before i get to very specific questions uh, you know and and discuss the views of the cynics and the critics with you uh, would you like to explain to the lay listeners uh, who are not that clued in what makes the budget a good statement of intent in the context of uh, the current economic uh, situation the present troubles and challenges uh, for the economy it um, what the budget has done and what it seeks to do you know when you see to step back and maybe go back a year to understand the state of the economy even before covid i think all of us um, appreciate that growth was slowing but i think it it's important to dig deeper into the drivers of the slowdown and if you look at gdp from the expenditure side which is essentially consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports you know you recognize that in the last 5 years growth was largely driven by consumption growth private consumption growth which was about you know 7 and a half percent on average and this is very different from the last uh, uh, you know burst of growth that india had between you know between 2003 and 2010 which was much more asian in nature in the sense that it was driven largely by exports ex you know it was exports going at 18% a year for 6 or 7 years that drove a large investment cycle uh, that created jobs and that in turn uh, you know uh, w- w- triggered a consumption growth here we really had consumption as the primary driver of growth exports have been very weak about 2 and a half percent or so on average over the last 5 years in part because of you know the global economy slowing and, and the deglobalization that we're aware of the the issue really with the consumption growth was some of this growth was being driven not by organic income growth but really by households running down savings and taking on debt uh, and there was a limit to you know how much that could go on so you if you notice carefully you will see that even in the year before covid uh, 
consumption growth had begun to slow, uh, right? From about seven and a quarter percent down to just the low sixes. Um, so, so, so one couldn't bank on consumption, and to the extent that households uh, perceive, uh, you know, uh, COVID to be a quasi permanent hit on their on their incomes and their jobs, we should not expect consumption to pick up in a hurry. I think one of the more revealing data that just came out on Friday evening was the RBI's uh, consumer confidence surveys. And while confidence has picked up, I think a really important number to look at was that when households are asked, where will your spending be one year from now? Actually, that number has gone down back to its September level. So we saw some improvement in October, November, December, but now it's lapsed back to September. So to the extent that there has been a quasi-permanent uh, income shock here for many income households, you see uh, unemployment has gone up um, you know, in the CMI labor force surveys. You see even in January, uh, demand for Enrega is 40% higher than the previous January. There is you know, an income hit to many parts of the economy, and that will manifest in consumption growth you know, recovering slowly. What you're seeing right now is this burst of consumption from the upper income households. People talk about a K-shaped recovery where the upper end has done very well. Their incomes have been protected. Um, their saving rates have been forced up. So there's a lot of fuel in the tank that they have to express themselves. And I think what you're seeing in the last, uh, you know, in the, in, in the next quarter or two is the upper income households kind of uh, catching up for what they couldn't spend last year. The issue is going to be when that uh, when that uh, burst of consumption is over, then I think some of the scarring that you're seeing in the labor market might begin to manifest more clearly. And so we should not expect that consumption growth is going to, uh, you know, uh, go back uh, go to its pre-COVID levels in a hurry. I think the auto market or the auto uh, sector is quite revealing. If you look at actual registrations of two wheelers between October and, and January, it's down 11% year on year. If you look at four wheelers, they're up 1%. So that's kind of some confirmation of this bifurcated recovery. So now if you kind of, you know, believe that consumption will recover only slowly, uh, exports have been choppy. We can expect some export recovery as the global economy recovers later this year. But will that be enough to drive an investment cycle? I'm not sure by itself. And then if you look at private investment, what you will see is even before the COVID crisis, Utilization rates were below 70% for three consecutive quarters. And during COVID, they've fallen further to 63%. So my short point is it's going to take time for the private sector to recover. Uh, private investment is endogenous to final demand. If consumption is going to be hesitant, if the recovery will be hesitant, if there is not much conviction that exports alone you know, will go back to the double-digit growth that we saw in the mid-2000s, it's unlikely that the private sector is going to start investing in a hurry until these utilization rates go back above 80. Now, I think that is the, the bigger macroeconomic context. So I think what the budget had to do was ensure that public investment and government spending remains the driver of growth in the next year or two. Uh, you know, and I think we, I have argued a lot in the past that if you have a big public investment push, uh, you A, increase aggregate demand, B, it has estimated to have large multiplier effects in the economy. Um, uh, C, it is labor intensive to the extent that you create construction jobs and it will fill some of the labor gap. And D, you know, infrastructure provisioning just improves medium term competitiveness. So I think the budget's challenge was how do we increase um, public investment and government spending uh, you know, for the next couple of years, even as we reduce the headline deficit, because uh, we know now that the total public sector borrowing requirement in India is going to be, you know, upwards of 15% of GDP this year. This is not an aberration. All emerging markets have seen their fiscal deficits widen sharply. So I think the central challenge was how do you boost public investment and at the same time bring your deficit down? For me, the most obvious way to reconcile those objectives was to push hard on asset sales. And I think that's why I think the budget uh, needs to be commended because what you're seeing is higher public investment over a few years, financed by asset sales, and that allows some deficit consolidation. Uh, right. And um, except that, uh, you know, so I'll, I'll immediately wear my cynic hat here. And, Please. You know, yeah. ask you that, you know, for those of us like you and me who've been looking at budget numbers for years and years, uh, 
uh, we all realize that you know the asset sales or the disinvestment privatization uh, non tax revenue target number that comes in the budget every year every year has become more like an accounting entry you know when i think the bureaucrats who make the budget when they look at you know what is the it that they are going to raise in the tax revenue what is it that they need to spend in a year and what is the fiscal deficit target that the frbm has spelled out for that particular year and whatever you know is is the sort of unmet num uh, uh, the difference between these three in the equation that tends to become the disinvestment target which is never met in the last 3 to 4 years that that figure that target has never been met and uh, i can say this that you know when i started my career as a journalist the first story that i wrote uh, uh, more than 20 years ago <laughs> was that erin dev was going to be disinvest uh, going to be privatized yeah. so yeah. Uh, like you say you know implementation is key but that that is what it has been for the last 20 years what's going to change this year the bureaucrats right. are the same you know policy is same the ministry is the same puja that's a legitimate observation and uh, as i've written repeatedly that this budget is now all about execution uh, 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 both on both sides of the ledger we need to execute and create those uh, that public investment this year to give that to give the demand stimulus to the economy at the same time those asset sales need to happen and so you're right ultimately the budget will be judged by what the efficacy of the execution is i will simply say that i think this is not a normal year i think there's a certain urgency that the macroeconomic environment uh, 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 you know uh, is uh, creates this year and my point is you know in a normal year uh if you don't as you said if you don't meet your asset sale targets and you need to keep to your fiscal deficit uh, normally capital expenditure is the first one to be cut but i think there's hopefully a sufficient recognition in the country here that for the reasons i laid out in the beginning we really can't have the fiscal impulse be very contractionary in this year uh, we really need public investment to drive growth over the next 12 24 months otherwise india's recovery back to its pre pandemic path will take much longer and the recovery will remain incomplete for the near future so i think there's perhaps and i think i would just take comfort from what we're seeing from october onwards that uh, once the economy opened up we're seeing very strong capital expenditure spending october november december uh, the liquidity numbers suggest january so that gives me a bit of hope that given these exceptional circumstances uh, that public investment will need to happen now you're exactly right that if the public investment happens and that boosts demand we'll have to bridge the gap on the revenue side because already next year's fiscal deficit target of 6.8% you know is considered as higher than what the bond markets uh, expected uh, and so we don't want a situation where uh, uh, the fiscal deficit number is higher i don't think it will be because that will put a lot of pressure on bond yields and that will tighten financial conditions so just as there is an imperative for higher public investment i think hopefully there's a recognition that we can't let the fiscal slip here i'll just make two final observations one is we need the asset sales to happen not just for revenues but i think to send a signal here that this is a paradigm change on the public sector's balance sheet that you know we need to rethink uh, the balance sheet we certainly need more infrastructure investment more health or education spending and that should be financed not by tax revenues but by selling less productive assets i can't think of a better time when you can when you can execute these asset sales given the buoyancy in equity markets given the glut of global liquidity uh, looking uh, for yield so this would be an opportune moment i think of this as an arbitrage where you've got you know a a a, a, a gradual recovery on the ground but a lot of buoyancy in the asset markets and the only way to bridge that arbitrage is you sell uh, assets at, at at high valuations and then you plow those resources into the real economy to bridge the gap the second is so i think that's one reason and i agree with you we we would need to wait and see but i'm hoping that will happen the second reason is i think one other distinction from this budget is you know um asset sales apart the revenues have been very conservatively budgeted and i'll just give you two examples here one is for this year itself the re number uh, uh for that tax revenue number to be realized in the re you need uh, revenues tax revenues in jan feb and march to contract 20% these same revenues net of excise i'm talking about need to contract 20% these same revenues go 25% in the last quarter so i think we will exceed this year's re number uh, and we think gross taxes will look closer to 10.5% of gdp not 9.8% now on that higher base if you have to meet next year's b number 
on this higher base that I'm talking about. Then in fact, net of XI, the tax buoyancy that's estimated is less than one, it's 0 0.8. So my short point is I won't be surprised if tax revenue surprise to the upside even next year. That creates a little bit of a buffer uh, in case you don't meet asset sales or if oil prices keep going up and you have to cut excise duties. But you know we should not be relying on that buffer. We need to implement both the asset sales and public investment. I think given the you know urgency of the situation, I'm hopeful that it'll happen. Uh, so let's look at the numbers. Uh, how much is this capex uh, push dependent on asset sales? Uh, 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 if the asset sales for some reason uh, do not uh, take place or if that target is not met, what will be the impact on this uh, capex target figure? No, I think that's a very legitimate question. So the, the way the numbers stack up, uh, you know, FY21 RE to FY22 BE, uh, capital expenditure is supposed to go from 2.3 to 2.5. That's about 0.2% of GDP higher. Now, you know, 0.2% seems low, but remember next year, nominal GDP, GDP will be growing, is, yes. is growing at, you know, at the budget estimates 14%. My sense is that we could be surprised. 17% at least. Yes, because, because you know, one should think about forecasting on a quarter, quarter by quarter annualized basis. If you look at the quarter and quarter annualized profile, or even 4% for the next four quarters, the year-on-year -year number for real GDP growth in FY22 is 13.5%. If you take a deflator of three and a half, that's nominal GDP of 16 or 17. So don't be surprised if we get that nominal GDP number. And my point is that just to keep the share of CapEx the same, CapEx will have to grow at 17% just to maintain that 2.3% ratio. It will have to grow you know, much higher than that to go to 2.5. But you're right. So the way the budget looks is the 2.3 goes to 2.5 and asset sales are 0 0.2 to 0 0.8. So there's 0.6% of GDP in asset sales. If those don't materialize, then I would, uh, I would worry that A, uh, uh, you know, uh, capital expenditure may need to be cut. Uh, and B, there might even be pressure on the fiscal deficit. Let me pick one last point. If we just take a two-year perspective, FY20 to FY22, uh, the reason I talk about this asset swap is because if you just look at these two years and ignore the crisis here, given it was an abnormal year, what you'll see is that capital expenditures go up by 0.8% of GDP uh, and asset sales go up by 0.6% of GDP. So again, subject to the budget numbers being realized, if they are realized, one way to think about this over a 24-month time period is about 75% of your capex uh, increase is being financed by asset sales. But again, uh, we need we need for these numbers to be realized. True. Uh, uh, let's look at now the uh, you know the revenue expenditure uh, because uh, you know and let me quote my friend Ratan Roy here uh, his calculations. Uh, he he's been saying that you know the revenue deficit. Uh, which measures how much government borrows to finance its revenue expenditures. Uh, it, it was budgeted uh, last in last year's budget at 77% of the fiscal deficit, which left only 23% of capital expenditure. In the revised estimates, it shrank to 21%. And now in this new budget for next year, this has been budgeted at 24%. So this isn't really a very big uh, shift in terms of composition of public spending. Uh, how do you see this argument? And he has made this argument in the past that a large part of government borrowings are spent for paying pensions and salaries and even past borrowings. Uh, yes. Where does this fit into the uh, entire budget uh, uh, arithmetic? No, so I, I would look at it. Uh, I see Dutton's point more largely, but I think I would just look at what I pointed out in the last uh, over a two year period. So if you look at FY22, yeah, you just the cleanest way to look at this is as a share of GDP across two years. How much of the increased capital expenditure is being financed by asset sales? Capital expenditure goes from 1.7 to 2.5. That's a 0.8% increase across two years. Asset sales go from 0.2 to 0.8, which is 0.6. In other words, three fourths of the increase in capital expenditure is being paid for by asset sales. Uh, uh, some of it, of course, by definition, the residual is paid for, paid for by revenue expenditures. So again, this is all uh, uh, Puja subject to realization. 
Yeah, and and uh, what about the, on the revenue expenditure and, uh, side of of the budget? How is that looking? Because the, uh, also, you know, uh, the the budget estimates are budgeting a drop in pension expenditure. I don't know how they're going, especially for defense and central government employees. I don't know how how realistic that is. Yeah. So 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 um, so again, there are many ways to cut the revenue side uh, because you've got interest, and one of the complications is because nominal GDP was contracting this year. As a share of GDP, things bounce around. The other is subsidies. Remember, uh, one of the reasons the deficit was higher is a lot of subsidies have been brought from on off balance sheet to on balance sheet this year. Some of them are repayment of previous arrears, so it's a one time effect, and it doesn't show up next year. So I think an, another way, perhaps the cleanest way to understand the fiscal impulse next year in an aggregate sense, is to look at uh, total expenditures, net of interest, and subsidies. Right. So we take interest out because that's non-discretionary, and we take subsidies out because that's where most of these on-balance sheet to off-balance sheet movements have happened, and there are many one-offs this year, FCI as well as fertilizer. If you look at it this way, the, here's the conclusion you come to, that actually government spending was stronger even in 2019-20, but we failed to pick it up because those final numbers came out in, in the month of May in the height of the pandemic. And what you see is the ratio that I'm talking about, total expenditure, uh, net of interest and subsidies typically averages 8%, you know, in the three years before 2019. In the pre-pandemic year, that number goes from about 8 to almost 9%, to 8.9%. And then in the pandemic year, 8.9 goes to 10.8. So effectively, as a share of GDP, we're seeing total expenditure rise by about three percentage points over three years. Now, you're exactly right. As a share of GDP, this comes down by 0.5% of GDP in the budgeted number. So 10.8 for FY21 becomes 10.3 in FY22. So even as CapEx is rising, you're rightly seeing revenue expenditures as a share of GDP is coming down. Uh, the, uh, and so you know, what we want to do, of course, is minimize how much that ratio falls, which is why it's really important that we don't undershoot on asset sales because you don't want expenditure to fall by that amount. Uh, the thinking here, of course, is, you know, CapEx is going up, CapEx has higher multipliers, revenue to GDP is coming down, that may have slightly lower multipliers, so the impulse on the economy could still be positive. But it is right, the way to think about this is, there was an increase in spending of about 3% of GDP, and half a percent of that will be withdrawn in FY22 as a share of GDP. Right. And so this is, of course, this takes care of uh, how things are likely to pan out uh, if uh, everything goes as as uh, uh, we've been discussing and is implemented in the next one or two years. But in terms of there is also a, a medium to long term correction of economic strategy that is required. And uh, here I'm talking about another piece that you wrote some time back about how even in the recovery in the pandemic, uh, you know, like uh, 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 the different classes in the economy have uh, suffered differently and therefore their ability to recover is different. Uh, the K-shaped recovery, etc., that everybody is talking about. This is not just in India's case post-pandemic. This is also a more longer term story where, where uh, the composition of demand uh, for different classes or, or of people is different. And, and, and uh, for the bottom of the py pyramid, uh, uh, the, the opportunities for jobs and incomes aren't uh, uh, as, as easily available as it is for, for the rest. So uh, on that correction that is needed in the in in the economic strategy, of course, I realize that you know one or two budgets cannot fix uh, such a structural problem. But there, what do you think? Uh, uh, you know, if, if did something come on that? Yeah. No. So Pooja, you put your finger on the button, which is that, and I think we don't fully appreciate this, uh, that uh, you know, COVID, unfortunately, around the world has affected a is essentially an, a, a induced an effective transfer of income from the poor. To the rich. The digital divide has gotten more exacerbated. And uh, while inequality uh, you know, is undesirable for a variety of reasons that we know about, it also has an impact on steady state demand. Because for every dollar that moves from the bottom of the pyramid to the top of the pyramid in the steady state, uh, you will find that the marginal propensity to consume is lower. And therefore, a steady state consumption growth will be lower. Right? So I think that we need to keep that in mind, that at the end of the COVID year or FY22, you will see around the world that if, in fact, we could measure measure GDP on the income side, my bet is, and this is true of most emerging markets and developed markets, 
that upper income to GDP would go up, profits to GDP would go up, right? For listed firms, SME profits to GDP would go down and income to GDP at the lower end would go down. So you're seeing this effective transfer of income. And we wrote about this when the GDP numbers came out in July to September quarter, right? That the headline number was much better. The economy contracted 7.5%, people had expected worse. But what was worrying about it was the composition that listed company profit had grown at 30% of GDP in that quarter. And on the income side, remember GDP is nothing but the, is the sum of operating profits, wages and indirect taxes. So if the operating profits of the listed companies is growing 30%, right? And the economy is still contracting 7.5%, one can simply uh, uh, induce uh, uh, from that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the pressure on unlisted firms and, and labor. So you're exactly right that you will see this redistribution. Uh, my point is that you know over any eight or ten year period, uh, we haven't seen emerging markets grow at the kind of growth rates India needs, seven or eight percent, without export growth. So I'm going to come back to my old theme that India really needs for exports to fire in the next seven eight years. The typical story has been strong, sustained export growth generates uh, uh, incentives for private investment, exactly like we saw in India in the mid 2000s. Investment in turn creates capacities so that the recovery is sustainable. You know, a current account doesn't blow up, inflation doesn't blow up. It creates employment, that employment creates income, that income in a way drives consumption. So consumption really is endogenous to, uh, to income growth and job creation. So I would go back to saying that in the near term, public investment will need to drive the recovery uh, to give the private sector some time to heal. But in the medium term, we really need to go back and kind of re-examine uh, in a world in which you know, globalization may not be at its peak, how can India increase its export share in the world? Uh, because that has to be the sustainable driver of medium term growth. And uh, uh, given this uh, medium term objective, what did you think of the customs duty structure that is now evolving uh, and uh, some clarifications have come uh, from ministry officials on what they're thinking of Atmanirbharta, etc. is behind this whole customs duty structure? Yeah, I think, I think uh, we, need to, uh, we need to be careful here you know, in a world of global value change. Uh, typically what happens are that uh, the, the domestic value add is, is quite limited. You import, you add some value and, and you export. And so, you know, uh, this is learner symmetry theorem, a foundational theorem of trade theory saying that in essentially an import tariff is, is, is like an ex, it has the same impact as, as an export tax. So I, I, think, I think we need to be careful. I, I, I think we need, uh, you know, the infrastructure investment hopefully will make India more competitive. Uh, I, I think uh, we need to make sure the rupee remains uh, contained, but we have to find a way of, you know, going, finding a way back into global value chains because that's how most, mo you know, most of trade is organized. Um, I, currently, given what's happening in China, uh, many firms are looking for uh, a hedge, uh, you know, under this China plus one uh, mantra in the region. Uh, and India has the size and the scale to attract many of these firms because they get the dual benefit of catering to a large domestic market and also getting access to a cheaper factory production. So I would hope that we would make the supply side investments we need um, to come across as a viable destination for firms that are leaving China and thereby use that as a means to integrate into global value chain. And uh, before I ask you to talk about uh, monetary policy and the coordination with fiscal policy, uh, you know, I, uh, my last question on the budget itself is that, you know, uh, how realistic is the new fiscal uh, correction paths, uh, uh, you know, and the new targets uh, that have been laid out now? Uh, are, so, are they doable? Yes. I think they're doable. In fact, I would argue that if the economy recovers, the fiscal consolidation path needs to be a ceiling and not a path and not a flaw. Uh, uh, remember, uh, debt to GDP is going to be close to 90% uh, uh, at the end of this year. Uh, and so uh, uh, while I think you need a big public investment push now, and fiscal policy has been appropriately counter-cyclical, we should also be counter-cyclical in the other direction. Uh, to ensure that debt is sustainable, you need both growth to fire, but you also need your deficit to be sustainable. So 
I would hope that um, the path laid out serves more as a ceiling. And if India in the next two years does rebound faster than is currently believed, that the pace of consolidation actually is faster. Uh, right now, the path is one which is uh, the level of borrowing is higher than what bond markets um, uh, anticipate. So I think we should, I think we should consider that as a as a ceiling, uh, uh, more than a target. And as the economy does better, withdraw stimulus with the same speed and alacrity that we've put it in. And, um, uh, you know, this stimulus has been in place for long. It's only that, you know, now it's going to show in the fiscal deficit numbers because a lot of this has been brought onto the books. But, I mean, uh, uh, fiscal uh, policy has uh, been uh, loose for long. Right? No, and, and Pooja, you're right. You're exactly right. So, in fact, again, something that uh, you know, we've written about for some time is the public sector borrowing requirements had approached about 9% even by 2018 19 and part of this is, I think, because as the economy began to slow, there is inadequate appreciation of this. Government spending on, this is GDP data. If you look at government spending growth in real terms for the three years before COVID, it was growing at almost 11%. It was growing at twice the pace of the private sector. Now, one can argue that as the economy was slowing, government was uh, playing a counter-cyclical role. That meant that what economists call the public sector borrowing requirement, which is Central government, state government, and off balance sheet had already reached 9%. That's going to increase to about 15% in the COVID year. It comes down to between. Which is more than savings, no? Which is more than uh, household savings. Yes. So, so there, there, Pooja, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in the context of monetary policy. So, uh, the overall savings in the economy this year was higher than that uh, because the current Naturally. account. Yeah, the current account was ultimately, see, the current account deficit is the best barometer of the savings investment gap in the economy, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The current account was in surplus in FY21 because, uh, you know, you had private sector precautionary savings rise very sharply. And therefore, the fact that you have the current account in surplus meant that the increase in private sector savings investment surpluses was higher than the increase in the government's uh, savings investment deficits right so the so so the increase in the private sector saving was more than the government deficit widened which is why the current account went from a, uh, a deficit of almost one percent of gdp pre-covid to a surplus of one percent of gdp covid year but that is exceptional and i think that's my key point going forward that as the economy normalizes these household savings rates will come down we anticipate the current account deficit in FY22 to be upwards of 1% of GDP. So now we go back kind of to the pre-COVID environment and we don't have that pool of savings that was available in the COVID year to finance government deficits. You know, a lot of people felt with these large deficits, the RBI will have to do a lot of QE. Guess what? Total issuance for centers and states in this year is expected to be about 18 trillion. The RBI's purchases has only been 2.6 trillion. It's been 15% of the total issuance, much less than what any economist thought a year ago. And the reason for that is because you have this automatic stabilizer. You had a big shock, savings rates go up, and the private sector was able to finance this uh, uh, you know, largely. Now, going forward, we may not have that luxury. To the extent that the current account now goes back into deficit, the pool of savings is going to be lower. And therefore, we need to be careful about the path of fiscal deficits that I mentioned going forward, that that path potentially needs to be more aggressive if the economy recovers, because you won't have the luxury of those savings. Yes, India could join a bond index later this year, and that will give you some foreign savings, but that creates its own kind of monetary complications if the RBI is intervening to, uh, to, uh, to prevent the rupee appreciation. So, and, and therefore, in FY26, the, if the center's deficit is 4.5% and states are at 3% and other PSUs are borrowing about 1% of GDP, the PSBR will still be about 85 to 9%, which seems a bit high if the economy is doing well. So again, to summarize, I think it was important to give a CapEx push this year. We may need to do it again next year. But for fiscal policy to be counter-cyclical, if the economy starts doing better in the next couple of years, we should withdraw this uh, soon enough so that you don't have this pressure on financing these deficits and, and causing financial conditions to, to come under some pressure.
and we have not really seen government of india uh, manage to do something like this uh, you know so nimbly in the past uh, i just want, wanted to say that the, the record in the past has not been very uh, encouraging puja uh, at least for fy22 i just be a little bit more agnostic because you know if you're going to get 17% nominal gdp growth you know uh, you, uh, you know even if a tax buoyancy is unitary is a one one you know an elastic of one i think we may be surprised slightly by the revenue upswing so i don't think it's an fy22 challenge i think perhaps after that when we go back to the new steady state at that point consolidating you know but again we will we'll have to be nimble next year i think the asset sales are certainly something we need to focus on but we might be surprised on the on the revenue front if you, in fact you do get the 17% pick up in nominal gdp right but we are also then going to be approaching a general election and the propensity to spend and be populist then increases and uh, as it is uh, the from the frbm act the revenue deficit target has been deleted through an amendment a couple of years ago yeah i mean i think uh, from a from a medium term fiscal perspective puja i think the imperative now is just to stabilize debt to gdp again let's not focus about levels india is at 90% the world is at 100 but it's really important from a fiscal sustainability perspective that we don't let debt to gdp uh, start rising monotonically now a right. lot of that has to do with growth it really has to do with growth if the denominator if nominal if real gdp is at 4.5 to 5% then no matter what you do in terms of fiscal consolidation debt to gdp starts going up if you can get you know 6% growth 6 to 6.5% real growth that even if you consolidate slowly debt to gdp stabilizes and slowly begins to come down so i think the first imperative even for fiscal sustainability is to get medium term growth back to 6% or thereabouts right now the reason i'm bringing this up again and again is because i see a lot of complacency and i see a lot of patting on the back and a lot of uh, uh, self congratulation <laughs> you know going around uh, i i just want to uh, you know uh, uh, say that you know that we need to be also careful at the same time uh, this uh, these are good intentions uh, but but uh, uh, you know it's a lot of hard work uh, no it's ahead. going to be a lot of hard work execution is going to be key uh, you know the global environment has been very benign so far but if oil prices keep going up that's a negative terms of trade shock for india it affects the current account affects fiscal affects inflation so you know uh, at some point in the, in the future central banks will, will not be as uh, uh, you know as expansive and they might get more cautious so you're right there's a lot of uh, risks we need to be aware of uh, and 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 the key will be to execute the budget anything you want to add on monetary policy before we close well just to say that um, monetary policy you know again like other emerging markets um, faces that you know i think policy is facing a very delicate balance fiscal has to balance uh, medium term consolidation with the near term you know uh, capex push monetary policy similarly i think has to ensure that we saw uh, you know uh, uh, it was the prime mover last year uh, lots of rate cuts uh, liquidity forbearance it was necessary to stabilize the financial system now that the economy is recovering i think at some point the central bank will gradually want to withdraw um, that liquidity uh uh at some point again you know over the in the coming months uh, you want to ensure that real policy rates uh, are zero and and don't remain negative uh but at the same time the central bank has to you know uh, uh ensure that the government's borrowing program doesn't result in a uh, disruptive tightening of financial conditions which chokes the recovery and at the same time we also want we don't want the rupee to strengthen and if you're faced with a large balance of payment surplus the rbi will be intervening to prevent rupee appreciation as well so you can see that this is class the classical dilemma for central banks where you know you want independence of monetary policy you don't want the rupee uh, to strengthen and you yet want to welcome the capital flows and i think achieving that uh, will will be a, a kind of a delicate balance so uh, i think monetary policy did the heavy lifting um, last year i think the baton is now passed to fiscal and i think monetary will perhaps have to recede slightly into the background uh, i mean just to finally say you know on the bond market um, you know, given that the government's borrowing program is is more expansive than was believed rightly so in my view uh, and also you know the current account going into deficit suggests that those uh, one time extra savings that we had last year don't exist it may argue for a kind of higher bond market equilibrium and i think policy makers will need to ensure that that new equilibrium is reached kind of in a gradual non disruptive way so 
there's a lot of execution that we'll have to do. All countries will have to do this year, uh, both on the fiscal and the monetary. And my last question for today on the two, uh, uh, you know, how much of a risk uh, are going to be the two uh, parameters of inflation and second, the health of banks, NPAs, once this, once we get to know the real numbers? Yeah, I think on NPAs, uh, I think, you know, our history has taught us that we really need to front load resolution. And so I think when the IBC is back and running, I think uh, the, the simple message from the last decade has been the sooner we recognize, the sooner we resolve, the sooner we recapitalize, uh, the lower the deadweight loss in the economy. So I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we're, we're ahead of that. And as soon as these NPAs um, uh, uh, get recognized, we quickly get them resolved and recapitalize uh, public sector banks. I think uh, we've seen um, both, they need both resolution capital and growth capital. So as, as and when the, uh, the time comes, I think it will be good to ensure that public sector banks both have the ability and the willingness to lend. You know, right now, demand for credit is weak. Uh, when demand normalizes, we want to be in a situation where the financial sector and it become a little bit risk averse pre-COVID, both is able and willing to support that recovery. On inflation, Puja, I'm um, not really worried. I'm not overly concerned at the moment. Uh, yes, there are a whole host of incipient price pressures around the world. Uh, commodities have increased. Oil is now above 60. Uh, global food prices have picked up. And there is risk of cost push inflation that the RBI uh, has flagged in the last review. But and while you could see that for a few months, I, I just go back um, to the state of the output gap. I would argue that there's a fair amount of slack in the economy. Uh, uh, you know, if the way to think about the slack is to compare the level of India's GDP at the end of 2022 uh, with what the level of output would have been pre pandemic. Right. And so even if India were to contract six and a half percent this year, which is our forecast, which is slightly better than the uh, CSO's forecast and grow 13.5% like we think it will, even then you're still about five or five percentage points below where you would have been pre-pandemic. That tells me there will be a fair amount of slack in the economy. And you can see that um, in, uh, in core inflation dynamics. The annualized momentum of core, which was above 6%, is now running you know, at 3% or thereabouts. So uh, I don't see surging inflation as being uh, an immediate problem. Uh, we'll have to be careful as the economy recovers do firms pass on these input price pressures but if there's substantial slack hopefully that would not be a sustainable phenomenon however it, again it, it does mean that we should be uh, ensuring that real policy rates you know don't don't stay negative at some point go to zero and gradually normalize that liquidity so kind of any you know financial stability or fiscal dominance concerns are are allayed right thanks thanks so much Pleasure, Pooja. Thank you.